So, give me a definition of a boom. Give me an example of one type of boom. One type of boom is, for example, maybe the wealth given by God. Very good. Another type of boom. Uh, another one. Yes, she near all. Another boom. Doesn't matter. What are some occult powers people have? You know about that? Very good. Give me another boom. Um, ability to stand fire. Very good. Walk over fire. Does it boom? Ability to fly. Ability to have clairvoyance. Ability to remember previous lives. Ability to re have to know someone, their 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 karma, what's happening to them. To know their minds. Ability to heal. Ability to control the weather. Ability to control animals. Ability to subjugate. Those are all boons. Okay. Those are boons. Can boons be cities? Can boons also be cities at the same time? Then no Buddhas have clairvoyance. Then no monks who meditate on Tara can gain clairvoyance. Ooh, talk, 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 talk. But you can already do that. What's the question? Can, can boons and cities be simultaneous? Yes. Because, because. You can gain an ability from a god, and then you go to Tara and gain something even higher. But would that arise differently from a boon? That's why there's a difference between. Very good. So, can a boon and a city be at the same time? So, is clairvoyance a boon or a city? Very good. Depends on what. difference between a boon and a city? He said a city comes from the mind and a boon comes from a gift, from a god or a deity. So I don't agree. Do you agree? So then tell me the alternative you don't agree. Do you agree? I do. Do you agree? I don't agree because it comes from somebody else. It comes from uh, a word in spirit or... Okay, so what did you say just now? You repeat again. Maybe she didn't hear you well. A boon is um, is a gift that comes from somebody else. A city arises from your own mind. Right. You need to do that with anything. You don't do it at all. Not bad. Do you agree? Um, no, I don't agree. You don't agree, so where does the boon come from? Uh, the one, a boon is definitely given, that's true. But okay, the, where does the city come from? The city is. He says it comes within from your mind. So you don't agree with but that? But it doesn't come directly, just spontaneously. No, he didn't say it. He didn't say spontaneously. He says it arises from the mind. Yeah, but it's still relations to an external source. Because what, 7 Eleven? No, an enlightened being. Okay, fine. Oh, but he didn't go that far. Yeah. He's not denying that. He's just saying a city comes from the mind, a boom comes from an outer source. He's not going further with that. Do you agree with that? But you just say you don't agree. Because I was looking further. No, you don't have to look further. You've got to stick on to the point that he said. So where does the boon come from? A boon, come, a boon comes from an external deity. Examples of external deities. Shiva, um, Zeus. The Budao gods, Budao. Weren't you coming into that for a short while, like 10 years? <laughs> Budao. That one's in denial, I tell you. <laughs> Gypsy Linda's in denial. Yes? I don't agree with what Pastor David said that um, a city comes from, must come from an enlightened being because you can gain a lower city just from the bread, but it's not necessarily enough. Very good. But that's not what he meant. But, but that's, that's, not, that's not the mind. The bread is not the mind. So 
No, you guys are debating about completely different things. Yeah. We're not saying independence on what the city arises from. We're saying where it comes from. Okay, not independence. So you don't agree with him? You agree? That's good because I agree too, but I said disagree to see, throw you off and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy to throw you off, huh? Okay, so give me the difference between a boon and a city. Is it a part of you? No, it is given and it's on top of your consciousness. Correct. It's, it's just borrowed. Yeah. So is it yours? No. Can it be lost? Yes. Correct. Is there similarities between boon and cities? Can there be? Yes. From an external observation. Can there be an external observation that boons and cities resemble each other? Yes. Do you agree? Yes. Do you agree? Yes. Example. Yeah, Very good. Another example. There are monsters who can fly because they have realized emptiness, and there are witches that can fly because they have occult powers given to them by whatever spirits. Both are flying. And then there are a third one, which is neither. Give me an example of a third one that's neither. Give me a third one that's neither. Give me a third one that's neither. Very good. A plane. A plane. Plane. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that, that, that's neither. <laughs> I mean, no, no, it's not a joke. Make your mind sharp. Make your mind razor sharp. <laughs> there are beings who can fly because of wounds. There are beings who can fly because of their clairvoyance. And then there are beings who can fly. Neither, but they can fly. Airplane, if you sit inside. Is that a boon or a city? It's technology, why are they flying? So if you look out the airplane, you can see a witch flying, you can see a masita flying, and you're flying too. Make your mind sharp. That's not a joke, make your mind sharp. So, what is, what is the primary source of boons? Give me one. God. Give me another. Spirit. Give me another. Okay. Very good. Give me another. Please. Magic. Sometimes just magic. Incantations and spells. They have power. Because some incantation, incantations and spells of the druid, they don't necessarily co contact the god, they contact the elements. Elements, right? Elements can give you power also. Water, air, earth, and fire. So there are many things. Okay? These, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this with you guys, not to confuse you. You will have many people questioning you. You must be very sharp. And not everybody comes from the same background as you beautiful people. They're going to come back from a Western, Eastern, Northern, Southern, all times. So when they ask you these questions, they throw you left, a, a, left, a, a left field You'll be, like, you'll be stumped. Don't be stumped. Make your mind sharp. Very sharp. Think of all possibilities. The sharper your mind is, the quicker you think, the quicker you can answer logically, the quicker the other person's need for spirituality and understanding is, is quenched. Your motivation is not to impress them. Your motivation is to quench their spiritual thirst so that they can go on with their spirituality. That is your motivation in debate. That is your motivation in teaching. That is your motivation explaining and asking them and making and being sharp and remembering and being focused. Because why? Sometimes someone's spirituality depends on you and your answer. So when you answer with them directly and all possibilities and from different cultures, it can help them, it can heal them, it can save their lives. So you should definitely know all these things because you will encounter these and answer them with great compassion. Everything should be done with great compassion, even if it's wrathful, even if it's screaming, shouting, giving, massaging, love, whatever. Everything must be done with compassion.
when you do everything with compassion, you're actualizing your sadhana. How are you actualizing your sadhana? Because the whole basis of, of Buddha nature is compassion. So when you act out of compassion, you are reinforcing that is within you. So every day when you act from compassion, you are reinforcing the compassion within you so it becomes so big that it becomes permanent. Permanently manifested, not sometimes when you're in a good mood. Is compassion something that you're developing that is outside of you or inside of you? So, are you reinforcing it every day? How? By doing things from compassion. When you do things from compassion, you're reinforcing what is within you so that it will blossom all the way. Hence, doing things with a good motivation every single day counters what I said earlier when you are reinforcing with negative. All of us, because we're not enlightened, have negative and positive. It's what we want to reinforce every day. So if you reinforce the negative, you end up negative at the end of the week. You want to leave. You want to run. You want to disrobe. You don't want to be nice. You don't want to change. You don't want to transform because you're reinforcing that. Now, if you reinforce it correctly, at the end of the day, being a monk and nun, being a Dharma practitioner, being a meditator, letting go of samsara is very easy. You know why? Because you reinforce it. Some people call that brainwashing. It can be brainwashing because you know what? You're just brainwashed back from samsara back to another set of thinking. Samsara has been brainwashing you whole life. It's all brainwashing. Brainwashing has a negative connotation. It's all been brainwashing. Why do you think you do the things you do in Dharma so hard? Because you've been brainwashed. Why is Dharma so hard? Why is being nice so hard? Why is being honest and straightforward and not being lazy so hard? Because you have brainwashed yourself. That doesn't mean you're bad. It just means you have been brainwashed. Why do you need a company? Why do you need a lover? Why do you need to have nonstop sex? Why do you need to have a lot of money? Because you've been brainwashed. You're not bad. You've been brainwashed. Brainwashed what? To think if you had that, you'd be happy. And yet you're unhappy and you've had it, yet you don't know why you're unhappy. And yet the brainwashing continues because no one else is giving you any other philosophy to think about. Why is Dharma hard? What is Dharma? Compassion, wisdom, skillful means, working for others, breaking out of our shell, taking responsibility. That is Dharma. If that is hard, you have been brainwashed. Because being who you really are inside, a being of light, should not be hard. So you being brainwashed doesn't make you bad. It makes you create unnecessary suffering for who you really are, a good person. Being attached to our parents, to a girlfriend or boyfriend, to an ideal, to a lifestyle, to the way we were, is brainwashing. It's all brainwashing. So why is doing Dharma becoming Buddha not brainwashing? Because you're going back to who you really are when you become a Buddha. Everything besides that has been brainwashing. So therefore, what's the purpose of a sadhana? Why generate yourself as a deity? What is this of celestial Halloween? You run around in tar out the high on tar, trick or treat. It's a, it's a real trick. Well, to awaken the qualities of us. That's How does generating yourself as tar <laughs> awaken the qualities of being tar? Because we, um, we tap into our energy. Very good, and there's more. Anyone know? We burn seeds in our mind. Good, and there's more. A lot more. We we merit ourselves. Yeah, you said that. We also tap into the, the seed that was planted by the Lama. Who Very good. That's excellent. Because if you don't have anything to open, it won't open, will it? Okay, what else? There's, there's some other very vital things that are being left out with our practice or any practice of the sadhana. What is the key 
practice you are given to hold on to, to realign your body, speech, and mind. Stop. To realign your body, speech, and mind so that your habits change. Very good. No, you don't develop into the special quality of the vow. You hold a vow so that you're training yourself to follow the correct everyday what? Everyday what? I'm looking for another verb. By holding the vows every day, you're doing what to yourself? It's all correct, but it's not the word I'm looking for. It's all correct. No. Very good. So what did the Taoists tell you to not do? Tell me one. Tell me another one. Tell me another one. Very good. Tell me another one. There's ten in your rescue child, how difficult is that? Sexual misconduct. <laughs> so when you take this foul in front of who? So it has power because you swore to the Buddha you won't do this. So every single day you don't have sexual misconduct, you don't lie, you don't steal, and you don't kill. You're reinforcing that every day. So just think one day you don't do that, two days, three days, four days, a year, two years, three years. After a few years, you don't even want to do it anymore if you're even doing it. Why? Because it's been reinforced. Isn't that powerful? That is why the vows and holding them is very powerful. That's why if you're a pastor or a monk to be or a nun to be, break your vows all the time like some people, your mind just degenerates. Do you know why it degenerates? Because you don't even discipline yourself to hold them. And when you degenerate, you know what you, you constantly lie. You constantly hurt people. You constantly trick people. You constantly backstab. You constantly do things that you're not supposed to do because the power of that breaking that vow, the karma comes back that you do all those things that you're not supposed to do. Do we know people like that? There is direct connection to it. So when you hold these vows well, you will see your mind calm down. When your mind is calm, then it's able to look within to develop those seeds. It's like clearing the mud. Every single day, if you go to the pond, go like that, and then you want to see the, the bottom of the pond, you're going to see it. Why not? But if you, let, if you don't do this every day and you let it settle, will you be able to see the bottom of the pond? Similarly, every day if you lie, you steal, sexual misconduct, and you kill, the pond is muddled. So how is it we're going to see anything? I'm giving you a very clear example. Then Sankara. That's why holding your vows, even the basic refuge vows, is so important. Your pastor vows are so important. And when you have the great fortune to receive from a great bhikshu, the monk and nun vows, oh my goodness, you have literally planted the seeds to enlighten. Because these vows come from Shakyamuni himself. Just imagine when you take these monk and nun vows from a bhikshu, but bhikshu is a fully ordained monk who's been pure his whole life, or a fully ordained nun, her whole life. These vows are passed to you. Imagine. Just the basic refuge vows benefit you so much. Imagine the monk and nun vows. And what do you gain from it? So much happiness, love, letting go. Your mind is calm. You find purpose. And to develop good qualities is not easy. Because why? You're not doing this every day to your mind. Does that make so much sense? The vows have a reason. They're not simply there to torture, torture you. 
you know what, let me tell you the truth. What's torturing you is you not happy about because every day you do this. You not having the dog is what tortures you every single day. Think about your example. Isn't that powerful? That's why I say, and then when you make a promise to a holy day, like you did to Lord Shubin, and I mean this in a literal sense, my dear, even at the cost of your life, you should not break it. If someone says, break your vow and promise to him, or I'll kill you, let him shoot you. Because as a result of holding that, you'll come back to him in hell. I mean, you're going to have to believe in the afterlife and next life at one point or another. Why not holding your vows? At one point, they're going to agree, all, all this is just a sham. You should never break it. Do you know why? It's not pressure here. It's letting the water settle more and more. Because if you go all the way to spirituality, the water is settled deeper and deeper and deeper, so you can see very clearly. It's very powerful. Everything you've experienced with your friends, family, all that, it should be inspiration to go all the way. Oh yes. Because would you like to be in that situation? No offense to anyone. Just that simple mundane situation. And carry on what you did for the last one month every day for the rest of your life. No offense to anyone. And you know I don't mean it and neither do you. Remember that. So therefore, doing the sadhana is very powerful. Hence, doing the sadhana that's been given to you without any vows, without initiation, is very powerful. Do you know why? Because if you break the sadhana, the, the, the karmic repercussion is not as heavy. It's like just throwing a stone, so a little bit of mud. It's not actually going like that. You go sadhana every single day.